Well, we're continuing our series that we've called Aliens and Strangers, and this is um, not our word for it. This is what the Apostle Peter calls followers of Jesus. He says that we are citizens of heaven. We're just visiting earth for a short period of time. And so while we're here, this is what he calls us, aliens and strangers. Last week, we looked at how we're supposed to respond to earthlings um, and particularly where we focused in on was those unfriendly earthlings, uh, those ones that will um, mock us for our faith or maybe worse, maybe persecute us because of our belief in Jesus, because the, we are living according to a different set of uh, standards and lifestyle. And we, so we wrapped up with this, uh, this verse and this thought, but we looked at from Matthew where... Um, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. So on one side, there's these people that the worst that they can do is physical, um, and it's temporary because it's only confined to this earth. He said, but where you should have your reverence is for the one that is the ultimate judge, the one that could decide the eternal fate of your soul, where you're going to live forever and forever and forever. He's, he's inviting us really to kind of make a comparison, if you will, to put these things on a scale. Say, who do you want to pledge your allegiance to? The one that has this limited power, it can only be physical and it can only be now, or the one that has the power of the physical, the spiritual, the, and holds all of eternity in his hand. Where do you want to put this? And, and the wording here really means this. He says, for those people that, that want to come at you personally here on earth, he said, don't do what psychologists describe as our natural response, fight or flight. He says, you don't have to fight them. You don't have to run away from them. But he said, instead, this word that he uses for fear of God is to hold God instead in this holy reverence, in this awe. And that's where our strength comes is, is from that. Now, Peter, um, who was right there when Jesus said these words, I think that he kind of had these words of Jesus from Matthew in mind. And we looked at this um, as we wrapped up last week in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 13. And by the way, any of the verses that we're sharing today are all on you version. If you want to follow along there as well, you'll see all those. But Peter said this, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? In other words, it's you're making it kind of difficult for people to persecute you if you're out there doing good things. But then he says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Now here, it's again, it sounds a lot like what Jesus says right here. He says, do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened. What do, what do people of the world fear? Maybe being um, shut out of a certain group. Maybe... Uh, having somebody laugh at them, and their ego kind of takes a hit. Um, maybe the fear of saying, I don't know what comes next, I don't know if the end of the world is tomorrow, or if I were to die, what, what comes after that, I, I don't know. And maybe there's that kind of fear. And so he says here, so don't, don't fear what they fear. Don't, don't be frightened by that. Now, that's an important thing for us to have clearly in our mind, because the very next word that Peter says is, but... So in contrast to this lifestyle, where people are walking around kind of going, uh, um, you know, looking over their shoulder, wondering what's going to happen, what's, what's next, and they're, they're afraid of that. He says, in contrast to, to that, here's how I want you to live. And there's, there's two things that we're going to look at today, two things that Peter tells us to do differently. When we feel fear that the world feels, don't give in to that. There's two things that he says that he wants us to do. Number one is to worship God. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. He's talking about an attitude of worship of our Savior. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Now, I want to, to help you round this out to see what, what this, this phrase is saying, I want to show you a couple of different uh, translations, a couple of different ways that the Bible renders this, okay? The first one says this, revere Christ as Lord. Now, if you're going to revere 
somebody or something. That means that you have an understanding of value. It's, it's like I said before, it's like putting something on a scale here and saying, which has more value to me? And that's the part that I would revere. I, 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 I have a, a higher estimation of this one. It seems it's more valuable to me. That's one translation. A second translation says, not just revere him, but acknowledge him as Lord. You're in charge. You're the Lord. You're not just the Savior of my life. You know, some people like to look at Jesus that way and they just go, well, Jesus saved me from my sins. He saved me from hell. Yes, but you also invited him in your life to be the Lord of your life. That means he gets to call the shots now. He gets to direct you. And so if we're, we're going, well, this, this has maybe a little bit more for me to revere then as I acknowledge him as Lord. Another translation says it this way. Worship Christ as the Lord of your life. So don't just revere him and don't just simply acknowledge. You don't just give lip service. Yeah, fear the Lord. But worship Christ as the Lord of my life personally. Not just the Lord in general, but my Lord, my captain, my God, my king. And, and so this is starting to get a little bit more in value. And then this last one comes from the message paraphrase. I like this. Keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ. Keep your hearts at attention. In other words, when other things start to distract you, maybe those unfriendly earthlings that are bugging you, and your eyes start to go to them, and when you do that, what are you doing? You're, you're kind of evening out everything again. You know, so you I've revered him, acknowledged him, worshipped him, but sometimes I start looking over here and it all oh, kind of about, well, I keep my heart and attention adoring the Lord. I, I got to put him back into the place that he deserves. I got to give him the high place that he deserves because as soon as I start looking over here, I start bringing it back down again. So, and it's natural. We're, we're now listen, we, we, don't, we don't have a soul. We, we are a soul. That's what God created. We have a body. Okay? We have this body that carries the real part of us, the part that's going to live forever. Our physical bodies carry that around. But because we're a physical body and we're living in a physical universe, then when things happen, when people say things to us, we, we feel it, and it's a natural human tendency to go and look. And as we do, we... So we keep our hearts and attention. We keep... Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. i got to go back to this. Let me go back. It's really as... I, I, I thought of it this way. It's, it's a, um, a phrase that photographers would understand more, and I'll illustrate this in a second. It's, it's called the focal point. What is it that I want to focus on, and in so doing, I can almost lose sight of everything else? That's what the focal point is. That's what a, a photographer does, is they pick a focal point, and they almost lose sight of everything else. Let me show, show you an example. A couple years ago, we were up north, and we stopped by the Taquanaman Falls. Here's a picture of the Taquanaman Falls that, that I took from over on the, uh, the shore of the river. My focal point is the waterfall. There's water rushing over that precipice and falling down into the river below, and there's the roar of the water, and, and that's where my focal point is. But just with a slight change, I changed my focal point from the water to the flower on the shore in front of the falls. Now you can still see some of the falls in the background, but they've begun to not have the same uh, predominance that they had before. They're out of focus, and if you look at it now, it doesn't even really look like there as as much water coming over the falls as before when we were looking right at the water. Now when we're focused on the flower, we don't see the water as much. Now. It's the same thing. When we revere Christ, when we acknowledge Him, we worship Him, we keep our hearts and attention, and we keep coming back to adoration of Him, it doesn't mean that we lose sight, we forget that everything else is around there. We're not just walking around like, you know, with our heads in the cloud bumping into things. We, we, we're still aware. But it's like the, the words to the old song that say, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full into His wonderful face... The things of earth, the song doesn't say disappear. They grow strangely dim. They don't have the same kind of hold on me. They don't, they don't make as much noise in my ear as they did before. 
because I've turned my eyes on something that is supremely more valuable, that has far greater worth than anything else. And so whenever I find myself, my focal point changing, this is the time that I've gone from reverent fear to fear of wringing my hands. I start to put things, oh no, I wonder, oh wait a minute, no, he's still Lord, he's still God. He, he hasn't fallen off the throne. I can still revere him and worship him as Lord. And now when I'm doing that, these things of earth grow strangely dim. My focal point has to stay on him. And that's, that's what Peter is telling us to do here. He says, don't fear what they fear. Don't be frightened the way that they're frightened. Scared of their shadow, looking over their, their shoulder, wondering what's going to happen next. You don't have to live like that. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Make that your focal point. So instead of being afraid, number one, worship. Worship. And you might have to keep on doing it. You have to keep reminding yourself. I, that's why I like how the, the message said there. Keep your hearts at attention. You know, you have to keep on going, oh, hello, heart. You know, I like uh, in Psalm 42, the, the psalmist asks himself twice in that psalm. He starts talking, about, hey, soul, why so downcast within me? Put your, put your trust in God. Change your focal point. You're looking here and all this stuff that's around you. Change your focal point. Change your focus. Look up here. We, we're going to need to have those conversations with us, with ourselves. And that's what's going to help us then to worship in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. But then there's a second part that he tells us. He says, don't be afraid of what they're afraid of. Don't be frightened by that. Worship. But then the second thing that we need to do he says, always be prepared, prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared. So there's not only worship, but there's this preparation as well that is important for us. Always be prepared to give an answer to the nice people. Um, he says to everyone, and that means... Not even to the people that are necessarily open to your answers. Be prepared to give an answer. Now, this word for prepared, it shows up in a lot of places. The, the Greek word uh, shows up in a lot of places in the New Testament. But I think one of the best ones is what Jesus himself said. Now, I know he's talking about his second coming. But I want you to see this from Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Right? Jesus is talking about His return, the rapture of the church, and then after that, His subsequent uh, rule, His thousand-year reign on earth. He, he said, you're not going to know, but be ready for it. Now, think about this for a second. I, I don't think that we're taking this out of context when, again, Peter heard these words, and he right, uses the same word that Jesus uses here that's trans, uh, translated be ready. He uses the word right here, be prepared. It's the same Greek word. Here's what I think that Peter might have had in mind there. Be ready for Jesus to show up in situations that you wouldn't normally expect him to show up. You know that, that person, maybe it's a coworker or a family member or a neighbor that seems so antagonistic to you because of your Christian faith. You know, if you're not careful, the doubt can come into your mind, God's never going to get through to them. Right? You, you can say, they are so far gone, their heart is so hardened, their eyes are somewhere else, they're, they're everywhere but where God could reach them. Be prepared. You don't know where Jesus is going to show up. You don't, you don't know how he's going to step into their life in a way that they're going, oh man. You know, one of our prayers could be this. Jesus talked about the God of this age, talking about Satan, has blinded people's eyes. Maybe our prayer for our, our neighbor, our coworker, our family member that's so antagonistic to us, maybe our prayer could be, God, begin to remove some of the blindness from their eyes. Begin to make them so disenchanted with everything else that they've tried. Let them get frustrated with, man, I thought the government was going to fix something. I thought I was going to be able to work really hard and make some money and make it easy for myself. I thought I was going to get married and have a family and then I was just going to be set up just fine. Let them be so frustrated by those things that they go, man, those things don't work. 
what's something else? But we want to be prepared. We don't want to be caught off guard for, for Christ's coming, but we also don't want to be caught off when, when the door opens. And we're, and we're right there. We, we're there on the spot to be able to give an answer to somebody that before we go, I never, ever would have thought that they would have been open to this message. Always be prepared. Now, this phrase, this be prepared to give an answer, that, that to give an answer, the Greek word there is apologia. That's where we get our English word apologetic. That, that means to be able to uh, lay out what you believe, not, not stumble around for words or be at a loss and go, you know, I just, I really don't know how to answer your question, but to say, let me lay, lay this out. And we're going to, the next time we get together to talk about this, um, aliens and strangers, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's going to be a couple of areas of apologia, um, apologetics that I really want to help you with. So we're going to kind of skip past this, uh, be prepared to give an answer part, and we're going to come back to that. So just hang on to that, because um, we will come back there. But here's what I love, is he says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason. That, that, that kind of simplifies it for us, doesn't it? Not a reason, like come up with something, but the reason. There, there's only one reason. And that reason comes down to one word, and this is what I think is the Christ follower's secret weapon. This is what defeats every argument. This is what cancels out every fear. Don't fear what they fear, don't be frightened. This one thing not only cancels out the fear and helps us keep our focus where it's supposed to be, but it also prepares us to share the reason to anyone who asks us. And it's this word that he says here for the hope that you have. The world doesn't have hope. They have wishes. They have dreams. They have, you know, crossed my fingers and really kind of wishful thinking that this might work out. This word hope, though, means a confident, joyful expectation. Our hope is solid, rock solid. And that's the reason why in, you know, as Peter says here, don't be afraid by what, you know, the things that make them afraid, don't be frightened by that. So, oh, hey, all week long, people are saying, the end of the world's coming, the end of the world's coming, the end of the world's coming. And we're going about our lives and they're like, how, how are you not freaking out about this? You know, or at work, oh, Man, pink slips are coming. Pink slips are coming. They're coming back. And you just go about doing your job. But you're like, how, how are you not upset about this? Why are you not nervous about maybe being out of a job? All, all these things that, you know, are going on in our world that scream across the headlines every day. And people are like, oh, no, oh, no. Look, we got to do it. We got to. Let's run here and take care of this. And you're going, I'm going to live my life the way that I've been living it. My focal point's right here. You're like, how can you have this hope? He says, by living that way, that's what's going to get people's attention. Because listen to this, friends. I love this phrase. If you get nothing else from this morning, let this thing burn into your heart. The person with an experience is never, ever, ever, ever at the mercy of the person with an argument. Somebody could come to you and they could have all of these initials after their name because of the degrees that they have. And they could say, we're going to give you the cosmological argument, and we're going to talk to you about this professor and this and that. And they're going to rattle off all these statistics and quote all these things to prove to you that there is no God, or if there is a God, it certainly wasn't Jesus, and your religion is just one of a lot of other religions, and you're very narrow. They, they could rattle off all these things. And you don't have to, you could say, you know what? I might not be able to refute every one of those arguments, but here's what I know. I know how I used to be before I met Jesus, and I know what my life is like now that he's the Savior and the Lord of my life. And that is something that they can never, ever refute. The person with an experience of hope is never at the mercy of a, a person that has an argument of why you shouldn't have hope. You're never at their mercy if you have hope. Now, look at, I want to show you a couple of the verses that tell us where we can have hope. 
with, first of all, look what the psalmist says. Psalm 25. We have this hope. I think you have one more slide to put there. We have this hope that if we place our hope in you, speaking in God, we will never be put to shame. We'll never be put to shame. Because, now, why would we be put to shame? We'd be put to shame if we said, well, this is what my God does. And then God goes, uh, sorry, you can't, um, can't come through for you. And then you're ashamed. You're embarrassed. Have you ever had that happen with a friend? You know, you recommend, you, put, you give your, your stamp of approval to somebody. You go, hey, you go see them. They'll take care of you. They won't let you down. I mean, this one of my best friends. They're, they're reliable. They're faithful. And your friend drops the ball. And then you're like, going, oh, I'm not kind of embarrassed. Those who put their hope in God will never be ashamed. They will never go, oh, man, God, you let me down. You drop, oh. I, I told people that they could count on you. And, and, and now, I can't count on you anymore. Right? Even when we're going through difficult times, Paul writes this in Romans. Listen to what, what he says here. He says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, peace and hope are kind of cousins, right? Seems like wherever there's hope, peace follows really closely behind there. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, and check this out, even in hard times, we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces more hope. And then Paul says, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's our hope as we even go through hard times Say, man, I'm suffering. Yeah, but in the midst of the suffering, I'm producing perseverance and character, and it's bringing me even more hope. And I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to come out of this stronger than I went into it. I'm going to come out of it with more perseverance. I'm going to have a, a more solid character, and my hope is going to be renewed again. I'll never be ashamed because of that. No, that's hard times, difficult times that we go through sometimes, and we have this hope. What about when we have to face death? Well, look what Job said. Job was, was facing death. And he says, though he slay me, talking about God, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Even if I die here, I know what comes next. I take my, next, my, my last breath here, I know my next breath is in the presence of God. So I can still place my hope in him even when I'm at death's doorstep. Peter, when he's starting this very first letter that, that we've uh, been studying, in verse number three of chapter one, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hey, if Jesus was raised from the dead and I've placed my hope in him and he's my Lord and Savior, that means I'm going to be raised from the dead as well. So I like how then Paul takes it a little bit farther. Paul begins to almost, uh, well, first of all, listen to what he says here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, be, are, are to be pitied more than all men. If our only hope is right here, right now, and we don't have any other hope, that's pretty pitiful. Because we've been walking around telling people that we have another hope. He says, but... Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He has indeed been raised from the dead. Then Paul switches, and he almost starts doing, um, you know, sometimes you'll see teams uh, out on the field, and we call it, they trash talk. You know, they tell the other team, you got nothing. You're going down. We're better than you are. We're going to kick your tail today. You're like, well, that's not very Christ-like. Well, 
Maybe not in that setting, but you know what? That's what Paul starts. He starts trash talking the devil and death. He says, in light of the fact that we've got resurrection hope, Jesus was raised from the dead, he says this, death has been swallowed up in victory. You're already done, death. And then he goes on, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death, you're going down. You, you already lost. You don't even know it yet. And so we have this hope because Jesus was raised back to life. We have this hope as well that we're going to be raised to life. So we have hope in hard times, difficult times, persecution. We have hope even when we're facing death. But you know what? In light of like this last week where people are going, up, what's going to happen when Jesus comes back? We have hope for the second coming as well. We have hope for the rapture. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when, Christ, when Jesus Christ is revealed. When he's revealed where? When he reappears and he says, I've come to take you home. We have that hope as well. We have this constant abiding hope. It's our hope secret weapon in your hearts set apart revere honor adore keep your focal point on christ and always be prepared i'm waiting for jesus to come in on a scene where i've never expected him before to give an answer to anyone who asked me the reason for the hope that i have I, my hope is in is based on what jesus has done for me my hope is on says it right here in the, in the Bible, I've seen it lived out, and I know the change that's taken place in my own life. And then he goes on to say this. Now, listen, we have this hope, but we don't use it like a club to beat people with. You don't have to beat people into uh, a knowledge of, uh, of Jesus. You know, you better get this or else, you know. You don't have to have this superiority thing of like, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm better than you. I get, that, that's not what Peter says at all. He goes, but... He says, now that you have this hope and you're going to share it, he says, here's three ways that I want you to share it. First of all, be gentle. Share it gently. Now, gentle means strength under control. Think of it this way. Um, think about if you were uh, wrestling a 1,200-pound uh, Bengal tiger. Okay? And the tiger decided, I'm going to keep my fangs pulled back in. I'm just going to bat you around with my velveted paws. At any moment, he could stick his claws out and I'm done. Okay? But saying I'm not going to use all the strength that I know that I have, that's being gentle. What we could say, hey, you know what? Listen, I'm going to heaven. You're not. End of story. Don't need to talk to you anymore. It's not very gentle. Remember, we, we just read it that when we were powerless when we could never come to a savior on our own that's when jesus died and came to us that person that you're talking to if they don't have a relationship with jesus it's what you used to be too so don't set up a stumbling block for them to come to a relationship with christ be gentle the second thing that he says is be respectful speak to them in a respectful tone of voice don't talk down to them Say, you know, but for the grace of God, I'm right where you are. We're the same. Okay. And then finally, he says, have your conversation with a clear conscience. Now, I think these first two really have to do with in the middle of the conversation. This other one, I think, is kind of a post-conversation. Kind of a dialogue with the Holy Spirit. How did I do with that conversation? Was I gentle? Was I respectful? Was I... Was I making sure that Christ was the focal point in this thing? And if the Holy Spirit speaks to you, perhaps you need to go back and ask forgiveness. Maybe you need to say, hey, you know what, I'm sorry. I was a bit rude when I was sharing that to you. I, maybe I, I, I kind of talked to you like I was a little bit more superior, and, and I'm not. And I apologize that I spoke to you that way. But this is what, what Peter tells us. In the conversation, be gentle, be respectful. After the conversation... Check and make sure that you got a clear conscience, that you spoke gently and respectfully to them. And if not, make things right. Make things right.
Now, as I told you, um, I, next time that, that we get together, I want to focus in on this apologia part. But it really comes down to this. I got one statement that, um, I think I did a slide for this one. That, yes, this is, this is where we ultimately, how we're going to wrap this up. My hope, this secret weapon that I have, okay, my hope is based on two things. The resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ, which I believe because of the Bible and because of the, the change in my life. Okay? I, believe, I believe this because the Bible said that it was true and the Bible has proven itself to be true. And I believe it because I know the change that's in my heart. As I was um, thinking about this, there was a lot of times when I'm, I'm studying, it's, there's songs that will come to my mind. I think there's two songs that kind of illustrate this, and you, you'll, this, we're gonna, we'll dig into this a little bit more next time. But for this part about the resurrection from the dead, there's a song that says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less. I, I, don't, I don't need anything else. That's what I've got. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He shed his blood and he rose again from the grave. That's what my hope is built on. And then this idea of, I know because of what the Bible says, we sing this verse in the song Amazing Grace where, that, that says the Lord has promised good to me. How do we know it? His word, my hope, secures. My, my hope comes from the fact that Jesus shed his blood and rose again. And the story was told right here. And it's true. And my life has been changed. I want to read a quote for you that I came across this week. Tanya Walker, um, an author, and she was specifically writing about this, these verses that we just looked at in 1 Peter. Listen to what she said here. The manner in which we communicate the gospel is not a minor add-on to the gospel itself. Very often it is the nature of the communication, our communication with them, that determines whether the gospel gets a hearing at all. It is important that the content of our message is a genuine reflection of the gospel and that the manner in which we communicate it doesn't become a stumbling block. Now, I want you to think back to some of those verses that we looked at. We said that our hope stands secure in difficult times, when looking at death, and when thinking about the end of the world or the end of, you know, what, what happens after this is over. You know what I've noticed? In all three of those areas, those are the places where sometimes even the most hardened people, the people that are most antagonistic to the Christian faith, those three times are the times that they're most open to hear about hope. When difficult times hit their life, when they're maybe at a funeral with a friend, a loved one, and they're wondering, man, where are they now? Are they just gone? Or is there something else? Or when they start hearing, you know, they might laugh about it. Somebody posts on Facebook, hey, the end of the world's coming on this day. And they're like, Shh. but they're thinking about it. If they were right, even if there was a one in a million chance that they were right, what, what does happen then? During those times when we're not running around going, oh no, no, it's hard times, it's hard times, or oh man, the loved one died, I wonder oh, what's going to happen to them now, what's gonna, or it's the end of the world. When, when we're like that, then we're doing the exact opposite of what Peter said. Peter said, don't be afraid. Don't be frightened by the things that frighten them. Keep your focal point here. Revere Jesus as our Savior. Acknowledge Him. Adore Him. Keep your hearts and attention on Him. And this other stuff over here just grows strangely dim. And when you're focused like this, and you're not running around wringing your hands when everybody else is, they all of a sudden look over at you and they're like, what are you looking at? How, how are you so calm? How, how do you have such hope? And then be prepared to give the reason. I have hope in Jesus. I know the change that he's made in my life. We have some, uh, some questions, as we do every week, some application questions for you to take home. 
And uh, let me just, I'm going to read them for you really quickly, but I'd like you to grab these on the way out and discuss them this week. Number one, how real is my level of hope? How real is my level of hope? And then kind of part two to that, how can I trade any fear that I have for hope? How can I make the trade? Number two, do people see hope in my life? Part two to that, if not, how can I change it? And the third one, when I answer people's questions, do I take the time afterwards to make sure that I have a clear conscience? That I did speak to them respectfully, that I did speak to them gently, didn't bash them over the head with it. You keep your focus here. People around you are gonna look and they're gonna, hey, what do you, how do you have a hope? What are you looking at? And then gently, respectfully, with a clear conscience, tell them, here's where my hope is. Not on these things down here, my hope is here. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for giving us such a rock solid hope and assurance. But this morning, I, I, I feel in my spirit like maybe there's somebody that is watching this uh, Facebook broadcast or they're watching this as a video later. And, and as we've been speaking today about hope, there's been something inside of their life that said, I don't have that hope. I'm scared to death when I think about the end of the world or what comes next after I leave here. I don't have any hope or assurance of what's coming next. My friend, if that's you, if you're watching this or live or if you're watching this as a video, listen, the Bible makes it crystal clear that there's no way that you could ever earn your way into heaven. You can't do it. I couldn't do it. None of us could. All of us have sinned. All of us in our attempts fall short of the righteous standard that God has. But here's what Jesus did. He came to earth and he took all of your sins. He took all of my sins and he put those on himself. He became our sin and then died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sins and for your sins. And so the Bible just tells us that if we put our trust in that, and you know what the Bible also says? Is that right now God is putting enough faith in your heart to believe even that. To pray a simple prayer. A prayer something like this. You don't have to pray these exact words, but a prayer that goes something like this. God, I acknowledge that I've sinned. I've blown it. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. I don't even deserve to have your attention turned to me. But I know that Jesus came and died on a cross and paid a price in my place. And so because of that, I ask God that you would forgive me of my sins because Jesus already paid the price for it. And not only did Jesus die on the cross, but he was raised back to life. And that is what gives me the hope and the assurance that I too can have eternal life. That I can feel your presence in my life now, but I have this hope and this assurance that when I take my last breath here, my next breath will be in your presence. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins, for saving me from that penalty of death that I had, and for giving me eternal life and hope and peace in you. And friends, I want to pray for those of you that do know Jesus as your Savior. God, I ask that this week that you would help us to have the right focal point. That we would revere Jesus, acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. That our hearts would always be at attention to him, in adoration to him. May, may the, the things of this world grow strangely dim. May that not be our focal point anymore. And if it ever is, may we quickly recognize it and shift our focal point back to our Savior that is so awesome and so revered. And Lord, as we live that way, may we also live in this readiness and this preparation that you are going to come on the scene in places we don't even expect. As our focal point is on you, people around us are going to look and say, what is it that about you? How can you have this such hope in such times of turmoil? And may we be prepared to give them the reason we have hope in Jesus. This is my Lord and my Savior. This is why I have hope. 
This is why I have confidence. This is why I have peace. This is why I'm not afraid of the things that you're afraid of because my heart is somewhere else. My focal point is somewhere else. God, give us the opportunity this week to be able to share with those who ask us the reason for the hope that we have. Help us to speak to them gently and respectfully. Help us to have a clear conscience as we speak to them that we know that we have spoken in a way that, that brings you the glory. We've made you the focal point. We haven't put any stumbling blocks in front of you. Be with us this week, God. Let our focal point be on you and give us opportunity to share the reason for the hope that we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thanks for being here today. Grab some of those questions on the way out. Go over those. Discuss them with a friend. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. I love you.